Chris, you want to say well? <laughs> We're recording now. And I think we are now live. Well, uh, good afternoon as it is now, everybody. Happy lunchtime. Um, we are here for the live Q&A of the Sustainable Distilling Panel. We've got all the panellists back again. It was a fantastic recorded session, so I hope you've enjoyed it. Please, if you've got any questions, um, I will um, open up the Q&A because I don't think I've done it yet. Apologies. Uh, oh, Q&A is open, so please uh, type in. And also, I've opened a poll as well, so um, please vote on the poll. Um, so we've got our, our great team again, um, and uh, we've got um, Russ and Chris and Will, and we'll just, if you just quickly introduce yourself and then we'll get straight into it. Uh, Chris, do you want to start? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Chris. I'm one of the co-founders of Cooper King Distillery, and we are a whiskey and gin distillery just outside of York in sunny Yorkshire. Will? Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Will, and um, I'm here at Green Sand Ridge Distillery in Kent, um, and we spread ourselves a bit thin. We make gins, uh, rums, brandies, and whiskies. Okay, and Russ? Hi, I'm Russ, Two Drifters Distillery, based down in Devon, uh, and we're the world's first carbon negative um, rum distillery, producing rums here in Devon. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, so, um, well, we're, whilst we're waiting for some questions to come in, um, one of the things that, because we had this um, uh, sustainable packaging panel, with, and, you know, because we didn't really talk about that very much, but we can talk a little bit about it today because I'd be quite interested to get some other views on it. One of the things that's occurred to me um, in all these discussions and looking into this a little bit more is that occasionally there seems to be a bit of a split from an environmental point of view. And it, and I think like, as we talk about this more, we, this will become more of, a, of, a, of an issue. Um, and one of these big things is about, um, and I know Rush, you've got some views on this. And actually this is the poll that I've got going um, about okay. plastic pouches. Ooh. So we've got poll, so please vote on the poll, basically the good and the bad of it. Now, some people are very great advocates of it because of the, um, energy saving and the carbon emission aspect of it and like that's like something that they're really and and so from that point of view kind of that's like a climate change kind of looking at things and that's what they're uh, in favor of then of course you've got the issue of what you do with the plastic when it's done and there's that issue and there and 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 that's you know with plastic in the sea and another just like general pollution of it and not being able to recycle it potentially my question is in some ways, like it seems like there's got to be a trade-off between the two, and it almost seems like like where's the priority lie? And I think that's because like both views, like people that are against them and people that are for them, both of them come from wanting to be better environmentally, but there doesn't there does seem to be some disagreement, and I think that's a, um, it's a tough conversation to have, but I think it's an interesting one because I think is the most important thing is to encourage people to do more environmental. Uh, sustainable things so uh, anyway does anyone want to kick off on that uh yeah <laughs> if that's okay <laughs> yeah, go for it. okay so uh it's it's really easy to understand uh both sides of this argument i think right so the the advantages as i see it for single use pouches uh is the the weight saving um the production saving in terms of energy um you know it is there's nowhere near as much energy to make a, a plastic container as there is to make uh, a glass bottle however um the difference between the two materials is that the glass is infinitely recyclable if recovered properly so starting with a material that is infinitely recyclable has to be better option meaning if you can get the balance between the energy that it takes to make it versus the, the plastic version, it will always be the clear winner. Mm. Now, is it a case that uh, the position that we, the snapshot that you take of how things are done right now and on big scale, um, it's probably leaning more towards the, uh, the plastic containers um, producing less emissions and being better in the short term. But is that the way, the best way to look at it for the for the bigger picture? No, I would I would argue, and that's why I feel strongly that that the single use plastic isn't the way to go. Right? It will fix things and reduce emissions a little bit. Great. 
but over a massive amount of bottles that are produced and, and replaced by them, that's a large amount of dead end material that, that goes nowhere. And so really you should focus on the bigger picture is what I'm trying to say, is yeah. to shift away from the single use aspect with everything that we do um, and, and find a way to close the loop, right? Mm, Although yeah, I agree, I would, yeah, sorry. I, I, would, I would echo exactly what Russ said. Uh, you know, in, innovation um, never never takes place when you kind of just accept a, a status quo, which is considered uh, good enough. And um, actually, you know, the industry never really moves forward, it won't move forward at the pace we need it to without, um, without you know, legislation and, you know, things like carbon trading. But I, I completely agree, a... a re- a reliant or any any single use plastics, um, even plant based plastics. You know, there's an argument to say, well, single use plastics. Well, it's you know, it's encouraging the extraction of of oil, so that's not great. But even plant based plastics, I, I think, are, are not the answer. So for a start, we we just need to encourage innovation. Um, I think the the argument for energy intensity is. Um, is, is complicated as well um, because there are ways of mitigating that and there are ways of, you know, we should be using greener electricity in our or greener energy in our p- production facilities anyway. So I think that, um, I think that shipping in, 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 in plastic is, is something that, that we should be moving away from. Um, I think the, the only, for me, the only kind of benefit of, you know, pouches is consumer engagement in, in, um, in environmental issues, um, but it, it's f- for us. We 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 don't we don't ship spirits in plastic pouches because we don't believe that the the net benefit, or don't believe that there is a net benefit, um, particularly when it comes to household plastic recycling. Um, I, I I don't. I've not seen any figures. I've seen figures on on the the, the benefits of using plastic in containers over over glass and aluminium. I've not seen any figures on the 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 amount of plastic film that is recycled in homes, but I would hazard a guess it's it's hardly anything. A lot I of the pouches, oh, sorry, well, a lot of those um, pouches about consumer recycling, um, there's a scheme we came across recently and the, the consumer then has to finish with it, pack it up, send it to TerraCycle, who then has to empty it, rewash it. And it, it's a very convoluted process. So yeah, I agree completely with you guys and we're against it as well. And, and I guess, like you said, it it does encourage um, consumer engagement around green issues, which is great. But at the same time, it's also normalizing, or if it's not normal enough already, single-use plastics, um, which obviously not something we want to do. And there's the other side of it as well. If you sort of step away from it, from from the sustainable side, but just the experience as well. So innovation in this sector, I think, comes from creating something that is genuinely green, but also still creates a really nice drinking experience. We're still making very good products and putting your stuff in a squeezy plastic pouch, like an orange juice pouch, mm. is not, it doesn't work. It's not nice. Yeah. I think also there's that there's a, you know, if, if you're a distillery that is using huge gas fired boilers to power your stills and you're shipping your spirits in renewable pouches and there by having something to talk to consumers about about being sustainable well uh, uh, it's not great it, <laughs> it's, it's not self. a great look like no, no, like re- replace your gas boiler with an electric boiler and then <laughs> you've got something to write to grandma about i think um one of the distilleries that's doing it and i don't but because they were they were on on they were discussing it on the panel um that you send you send them back to them but you just put them in the post box because the address is like they've worked with Royal Mail to do it, and then they are then recycling it. So mm-hmm. I guess like in that respect, that solves some of the issue. But it's still got to recycle it, right? There's still that aspect of it's not being reused; it's being recycled. So I guess there's that um, aspect to it. Um, so uh, yeah. So I mean, so is this is your thinking like make it out something better? I mean, what's the kind of so like the pouch, there's something to it, but make it out of something that's a better thing to make it out of. Is that kind of the idea or? Yeah, maybe if it was, so it depends what the recycling aspect is, right? And what actually happens and how energy intensive that is and how energy intensive the manufacturing is. Mm. Um, once you add up all of that, um, how far away are you from, from glass? And then is there an alternative um, material that could replace glass, right? That's 
you know, that's that's probably something that's worth investigating too. Mm. Um, I, 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 David, I, I'm firmly on the, the cynical side of this spectrum. I, I think, you know, a, a distillery that is sending out um, recyclable pouches, um, what is the proportion of their glass bottles that ends up in bars and mm -hmm. hospitality venues versus the proportion of recyclable pouches that you send out? You know, if it's, you know, our, I think our business is at, at the right at the end of the spectrum of most of our spirits going to wholesale distribution and to, you know, um, shops and pubs and restaurants versus direct retail sales. But it, it, it's, it's a fraction. It's absolutely a fraction. So if, if that is the hill that you're dying on as a sustainable business that, you know, we're sustainable because we've got recyclable pouches, I don't think it holds up because, you know, you're, you're shipping a, a pallet a week to, to in Autria and a pallet a week to Nectar or who else, and, and you're sending out a handful of recyclable pouches. Think about, I mean, I, I, I've spoken about before and I've, I've continued it, that the pyramid of, of you know, um, intensity in terms of carbon in a business, the carbon is not bound up in those few bottles that you, that, you know, the small proportion. The carbon is bound up in your water use, your resort, natural resources use, your electricity use, um, you know, so. Mm. But wait, I, oh. oh, sorry, just quickly. But uh, Russ, I think when you said you did your um, carbon- 30%, 30%. 30%. So it's yeah. still- So carbon. that's a big chunk. And that's, that's yeah. because we run ours on renewables. So we remove all that uh, electricity energy. So um, yeah. oh, okay, okay. those that emissions, sense. so that reduces yeah, the bill. So it's but, more yeah. for you proportionately because of all the other stuff you're doing already, right? Yeah. yeah. So if you, if, the I'm, more you reduce that, but you can't change. So yeah. I understand. Yeah, Sorry, so so what, what, what we're doing in this, this space that I think for us is meaningful is we're shipping um, spirits in 10 litre returnable containers. So we to to um, hospitality venues and mm. and so where where have you got one there? Can we see? One? Yeah, one second. Yeah. So okay, this yeah. is a this is a ten liter container. It's stackable and you can put them on pallets. And what we do is we when we send it out, we put a a, a prepaid return label just on the on the box. Um, now, um, that can go out to, uh, you know, that's saving 14 glass bottles um, in, into, a, into a bar or restaurant. And the actual plastic container itself, not single use, um, as long as they're returned to us, and then they come back in the post and, and we pay for it. So I think f for me, that's where there's a, there's a plastic that's being used there, but it's, it's being used for purpose because it's really hard wearing. Once it comes back, we can clean and sterilize it. So that's my, my mm. perspective on it. Um, Chris, I will come to you and say, I've just got a follow up on that. Sorry, on the 10 litre thing. So um, it's quite interesting because it reminds me quite a lot of like how gin and stuff used to be shipped, right? Like it would go to a pub in like a barrel or something like that. I guess the question, the slight question is if that was on a bigger scale. And I think it's a nice like innovative thing. I think it makes a lot of sense. How do you guarantee no one's mucking around with your spirit? So that has a tamper seal on the top. Yeah. So in terms of, but, I the... mean, once it's opened, once it's opened, it's like not in the not in the bottle, right? You see what I'm saying? Oh, you're I not going to so... use all ten liters at once. So once no. you've opened it and you filled maybe a couple of bottles up, then what's to stop someone just like cutting it with something else? I mean, you could argue that with bottles anyway. But you could do that with yeah, the bottles. Well. Very I mean, when, when, when we ship these out, we ship we, we ship them with um, a, a, a kind of tap attachment that you can fill with a bottle, and that oh, okay. that, that the business keeps and they hold on to. Hmm. Um, you know, once once that's in a in a business in a in a hotel or bar, if 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 someone adulterates the liquid, well, that's the same as same as adulterating a a, a glass that's, bottle. That's sure, true. it's easier to do in one of those, but it's it's still fraud. Yeah. No, I know. <laughs> Just, I'm just thinking about like what happened back in the day, you know. Right. <laughs> I'm sure no one's putting like extra sugar or creosote or something like that. I mean, these aren't <laughs> these aren't easy. They're, they're slightly easier to do with white spirits, but you know, when we disgorge a cask of spirit, you know, how how many are we disgorging in, into that? There are production issues, but those production issues are it, they're nothing to you know, Gordon's and Tanqueray. Yeah, I think it's great. I think any sort of innovation. That's the thing, isn't it? Now, sorry, Chris, you've been waiting for ages. I've been yakking on, please. No, not at all. It was, it was just, um, 
about transparency and, and we touched upon this in the, in the in the recorded talk about you know if you're doing pouches if you're doing a refill scheme whether it's your jerrys or bottles to, to when you produce your sustainability report each year let everyone know you know great so if you are doing pouches but 90 percent of your sales is through pouches through the post because of the pandemic then absolutely you know that's great and we can see that but you know like will and russ said if you're just doing it and, and sending you know one percent out then it, i don't know it'd be good to know it just comes down to transparency and and, mm. and through that transparency and through more distilleries hopefully releasing reports into what they're doing and the steps they're taking we, we're all collectively as an industry be able to understand what works and what doesn't and what can have an impact and what doesn't um and then yeah things would advance that way in a much more wholesome way mm. um we've got a question uh from bernie bernie asks um what advice can you give early startups to become more sustainable and offset financial cost <sighs> preparation planning I guess uh, we again we touched on the touched on this in the talk. It's it's planning out your your kit, your production methods, source where you're going to source your materials, what sort of bottles you're going for. Speaking to people like us, I guess, in other distilleries, and and just understanding if it's just about sustainability, you want to try and improve on about what what does have the biggest impact. Um, so you know, running on green energy is a very easy one. Uh, very easy one to do and implement very early on without that much additional cost. Um, it, it, it's, I mean, there's everything, basically. <laughs> Don't leave any stone unturned. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a daunting question, really. I'd say green energy, look at your kit and where you're sourcing your materials from as a, as a big starter. There's an example here. We were sourcing uh, grain spirit from, from across the UK. Um, we pested a local supplier, so now all our grain spirit is sourced within Yorkshire, distilled from Yorkshire wheat, which has quite a big impact on our operations. But, um, yeah. I mean, then what you guys, your input on that, it's, it's kind of everything we've been talking about in this session in the last. Yeah, it? that's that's an all encompassing question. So I would say research, 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 just just mm. do it. Just keep looking, keep reading. There's there's loads out there and just take bits and pieces. And, and yeah, definitely planning out exactly like Chris says. Mm. Yeah, I think that I'm mean, thinking about what what the decision making things people people go through. You know, one is the buying of a still. Um, now, if you're, if you're, th there are different ways of doing it. A lot of people will start small and 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 invest more money as as the distillery proves itself, and that that's pretty sensible. You know, I see a lot of those smaller, very early stage distillers with these kind of very small alembic gas-fired pot stills, and um, you know, I think th there's a temptation as as to grow. You just buy bigger and bigger versions of those, and and I would I would definitely advise against going that route um you know all three of us are big proponents of using green energy to to fire our equipment um you know chris is chris is doing a, a, a very energy efficient rotovat method to, to make their gin so you know if you're if you're starting small um maybe maybe go that route you're using electricity it's a very efficient method you get a really nice spirit and then you can always adapt the recipe and, and scale it up later on if you want a, a copper toy um so I think that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a critical decision framework. And, um, you know, the, the rest, you just got to keep your eye on the ball and, and just chip it off as you go. Um, bring up, the point about the road map is interesting. Um, so, Chris, are you using for your gin, is it a, are you using a multi-shot for your gin, I guess, if you're on a road map? Yeah, so that's one of the the biggest downfalls of a rotovap is even the larger ones are sort of only up to fifty liters. So we have two ten liter ones, uh, so we double capacity earlier in the year. But yeah, the only way to make that commercially viable is multi shot. If you were single shotting uh, right on a rotovap, you'd be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because um, I and guess I'm sorry. Um, yeah, for for a, our, our our gin, we wouldn't be able to do on a on a rotovap style still because of the botanicals we used um very high um level of nuts and um uh some of the other botanicals so it it yeah it kind of you, you you've got to play with what you got basically yeah it, it makes an interesting the point that, that, that is sort of coming into my head is that in some ways it, and for those that don't that are not familiar the whole, this idea of a multi-shot is you increase the botanical intensity so then you kind of make 
the your distillate is more botanic is more concentrated with the oils and then you um you then cut that back with neutral spirit and then you cut and then you proof it the point is you don't have to run the still so much so is, there's a question to say is a multi-shot system potentially more green or sustainable yeah. in that way because you're not using the thing it's not i mean yeah. we, we usually when we talk about it we talk about it being more efficient well, okay that's part of it and and you know the finances of it but actually to think oh you're using less energy so there is that it surprised it. me david that i haven't seen today a multi-shot distiller talking about the fact that they do multi-shot as a sustainability metric mm. oh there you go chris <laughs> and, <laughs> next investment. <laughs> next investment. You know, there, there's there's plenty of people with with copper stills, and we do a single shot. You know, that I'm not going to you pick your battle. Um, <laughs> plenty of people with with stills like this doing, you know, big concentrate on multi shots with with this still. And um, yeah, as I said, it surprised me that you you haven't seen that because yes. It is a sustainable mm. thing to do. Now, there are compromises that come with multi-shot gins, as you know, but also some great multi-shot gins are made. I think that when I, I the, the hairs stand up on the back of my neck, whenever I see a compromise in a process being described as an intentional thing that has been done, and particularly when it comes to sustainability. Mm. And, and if I... <laughs> I have to say, if I saw anyone describing a multi-shot process as sustainable, I'd be like, oh, that's interesting. You get what are you doing? So, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, the number of times I've, I've, I've read a website and I've seen someone say something um, and we do this because, and I'm like, no, you do this because you don't have that piece of equipment or that, mm. you know, you don't have, so it's complicated. So it's a, but it's a bonus. Yeah. It's a, it's a bonus, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, out of interest then if you run the figures if you were to do a, a multi-shot you know five times or something and you're still is it, it, it surely that would be beneficial i mean there's there's horrible problems with scaling up and it's not as easy as that we know but yeah that'd be, have you considered that just out of um, interest so, so we we haven't done any multi-shots on this still we have uh, on on other stills mm. and and today i haven't i haven't wanted to compromise on the, the textural element of our of our gin and when when you scale our our gin up a number of times um it does have an impact on the, the textural part of the, the the gin and and i haven't i haven't wanted to go that direction mm -hmm. but it is i think it's a it's a it's a brilliant point and it's a really valid point like if you can save a meaningful amount of energy doing a multi-shot process should it behove you to do that Mm. I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense with knowing like about what botanicals and stuff you've got in your gin. Well, that does make sense from the, the texture because I can't really see like if you keep if you just stick loads of nuts in the still, I don't really see like that you can really scale it up that much. I think like you were saying, that's part of the thing. So um, it's an interesting. Yeah, I think it depends on on, on what the what mm. the, the gin is. We need is, Anne but... Brock here on for this one, really. We need like PhD level Anne Brock. <laughs> talking about that talking about that yes yeah. Uh, yeah well there you go of course makes has made both types so um uh there's a it's an off the wall question it's not really about sustainability and i don't know if you're happy to answer it but i'm going to ask it just in case um it is from anonymous of course oh um <laughs> and it is for chris and he's asked what multi-shot multiple have you found that works best but i understand <laughs> if that's proprietary and you don't want to answer but that is at least i've asked the question it, talking of uh, PhD and, and, and the science background, that would be the head distiller, my partner, Abby, with the PhD and the science background. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think I should probably share that, but we have tried lots and there are, it's not an easy thing to scale up and double up. And, it, it, and like Will rightly says, with texture and flavor extraction and the interaction between the different oils and different botanicals, it's uh, if you start out with that idea to do a multi-shot intentionally from the beginning and you're always working at multi-shot it's okay but if you start out as a shingle, single shot and try to three five ten fifteen times it uh yeah you're gonna have a few months of uh, r&d ahead of you without any product hmm. so i've completely skirted around the question there but <laughs> I, I, i'll provide something or an answer just in the experience of some of the products i've worked on generally people kind of range between about three and twelve right in, on for a small distillery but it's roughly where people sit. I mean, there's an argument say if you're doing three, why don't you do five? You know, 
a little bit more because that makes a, I mean, that makes quite a big difference. The key thing is, and I think this goes full circle to what we were talking to uh, Bernie's question about, you know, when you're starting up is make the decision at the beginning, like doing your recipe development and doing the moldy shot thing. Like that makes sense and makes the most sense when you're starting. Trying to backwards engineer it is difficult. It's possible, but it's really difficult. But we will move on from Gene because Russ is like, yeah, who cares? Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> I've got nothing for this. <laughs> Poor Russ. Come on, come on. Um, I think uh, one of the things, Bernie says, thanks very much. And she says that um, I think that people often assume like it's very expensive to go green as it were. Um, but she says, obviously, from your experience, you've shown that that's not doesn't have to be the case. Um, you have to think smart, I think, though, for sure. Mm. um okay good um there was a question from well it wasn't a question from nevin but he just says uh, he's also striving to be as green as possible and he'd like to connect at some point so there you go nevin's a great guy i don't sure. know ask us a proper question though never come on <laughs> give us something please answer more, more questions um yeah oh here we go we've got ah, another question to come in is it a problem that customers don't really know the difference between recyclable, biodegradable, compostable, and bioplastic. Will, you are nodding like a little dog in a car. You really want to go Yes. <laughs> yes. And it's a minefield and, and mm. it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's bad. Basically, um, if it is, you, you know, people talk about biodegradable, um, as if like it's good that something biodegrades over 500 years, you know, everything is biodegradable. Um, so the, 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 the thing is that what, what we've had in the kind of plastics is we've had a range of plastics developed for the catering industry. So that like, if you go into Pret and you buy your sandwich on a little tray and your soup in a little pot, it can all go in the food bin and then when it goes to high temperature composters, it will all break down. But that is, that, that is not transferable to a home environment. Mm -hmm. So those kind of compostable plastics that are designed for the food industry should, should, should never be used in a home environment. It's not appropriate. So um, the, I think the, 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 the kind of compostable um, language and, and biodegradable is, is, is really different. And, I think I think for me for me the main the main thing is that plant-based plastics shouldn't be the um, the replacement for for single-use oil-based plastics. Um, but um, you know th there are some 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 things that are um, that are really biodegradable um, in in a number of days or weeks. You know the kind of potato starch wrappings that you now get your, your magazines in and things like that. But I, I do think it's a it's a minefield. It's not well communicated to the consumer. I was talking to our MP this morning about marks, you know, um, either identifying where things are made, um, you know, and and there is a mark out out there now um, which is plastic free. So you can and and if you want to get the plastic free mark, then you can't use any plant based plastics in your product. So they've taken a really hard line, which I think is really admirable. Um, but yeah, it is complicated, especially for the consumer. Mm. And, and there's a follow-up which says, shall we start educating customers in that direction? I guess the answer is yes. We're all trying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it needs a big PR campaign, that. Um, uh, I've got a question. Um, and please, more questions coming in, please. Nevin, come on, send us a question. Um, but... Secondary packs, the boxes, the things for gifting and all this kind of thing. What is your approach? I can go around to all three of you. Uh, Russ, uh, do you want to start? But yeah. Uh, what is our approach? The only time we use a secondary pack is on our selection of miniatures. So mm -hmm. the full selection of rums. And there it's a recycled cardboard box uh, with no printing on it at all. There's no, there's no plastic in there. Um, and it's tissue paper, recycled tissue paper that, that seals the thing. And then we've taken the line that that's a needless uh, accessory, really, for our bottles. And so we, we still uh, steer well clear of those. Mm. Um, so, yeah, no, no boxes at all other than that. Chris? 
Yeah, funnily enough, exactly the same position as Russ. So we, we've got 300 mil bottles in a box, which is you know, FSC certified, wrapped in a cardboard box. Uh, worked with a box maker for about two months to develop one that could go in the posts. Uh, so, you know, structure and origami, et cetera. Uh, so there's no plastic. Um, and then for the bottles themselves, exactly, you know, if you invest money into to branding and good labels, then we don't really need to rely on fancy secondary packaging, which will just go in the bin the moment anyone gets it. And I know, speaking to friends in the whiskey industry, especially from up in Scotland, that a lot of them, to be cladi as an example, are really trying actively to shun uh, the tubes and all the secondary packaging because there's just tons of it sent out and especially to on tray so the bars end up with you know wheelie bins full of tin tubes and presentation boxes are just completely pointless the tubes are particularly bad because you've got that like cardboard and metal and then there might be some like gold foil on it and they're just Mm. like (laughs) really recyclable Uh, well yeah unnecessary i think as as you grow as a distillery um, you, 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 might decide, uh, to, you, you might decide to be a distillery that serves your local market and is in bottles only and, that, and, that, and that's fine for you. You might have bigger ambitions. Um, and, and if you do, you will come across the point at which you have a conversation with a buyer who says, we need a box or a presentation box to go on the shelf. Mm-hmm. And, and I think at, at, at that point, you've, you, you've got to decide um, you know, do, where, where, where do you draw the line from a morals point of view? F- for me, there's absolutely no problem in, in having another secondary pack made, but just have one that is 100% recyclable and is FSC certified and doesn't contain a kind of little fake wax seal hanging from it that is plastic and is going to end up, you know, if not down the side of your sofa, like in the, in the, in the incinerator. So I, I don't, I, that I think su- sustainability should not be, um, should not force you to, to make your product less premium. It shouldn't force you to forego sales. Um, it, it, it should just inform what you do when you d- decide to make certain decisions. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. I know certainly um, one of the people that was on the eco packaging panel was, um, uh, Brian from um, uh, uh, Harvey Nichols, I think he's from. Sorry if I've got it wrong. My apologies. I've just what my mind went blank. He's a buyer anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, and um, but I know, like he's like getting hotter on not having those sorts of things. So it would be interesting to see if that continues to be such a driving force, or whether that will be because you're right. Like that, that there's there's a problem there, right? Like there's a you know. Um, and if that's what they're asking for, it's difficult to say no. Listen, so people will always ask for stuff, right? Yeah. People ask for stuff because asking a question is super easy. But if you say, well, usually we choose not to do this because for this reason, people would be like, oh, yeah, great. And then everyone's the wiser. Yeah, I think so. Right. We've got some more questions coming in. Um, here we go from Nevin. He says, um, uh, an alternative for using big volumes of water for cooling can you use chiller with glycol or something like that? But basically, so you can reduce your water intake uh, for, for, for cooling. Um, I'm sure we've got some views on this. Who would like to go first? Uh, hey, yeah. Quickly. I'll oh, go on. Go on, no, no, you go on, you go on, go on. No, we've banged on about gin continuously. I mean, you, no, you can use the, the glycol chiller. Absolutely. As long as it's run on renewable energy. Um, there's no, I don't see the, the big issue with that. Um, and that does save a lot of water. Um, it's actually exactly what we do. So, yeah. Yeah. For mentioned this before the vacuum stills, each one runs on a glycol chiller, saves 13,000 liters of water a year per still compared to if we were just running mains through it. So it can make a huge, huge difference, relatively easy to do. Um, yeah, we, we, we've done a big research project on this over the last 12 months. Um, and we've, we've since switched this still over um, from using mains water to using a closed loop circuit. And we, we looked at um, all of the solutions that are available. And um, uh, glycol's um, good, although it can be quite energy intensive. Um, there's adiabatic chillers, which Again, they use evaporative cooling, um, but they also uh, use quite a lot of electricity. Um, 
there's there's interesting so if you've got the tight if you've got the space what you can do is you can just have a series uh, and and it can be quite a cheap solution you just have 10 ibcs all stacked up along the side of your building and you can pump from one ibc um through your still now as long as those ibcs are at 20 degrees or below and um, then you can pump from one into a into a hot one and and you're good to go um we, we looked at that we actually ended up um, building a system where we have a kind of heat recovery into a thermal store and then it goes through a, a kind of wildlife pond to take it down to below 20 degrees. We'll, we'll publish the kind of findings um, versus all of the different options. The energy use of the solution we've gone for, for a, for a day's distillation is 0 0.4 kilowatt hours. So it's for us, it was the lowest energy use of any solution but it had quite a high carbon intensity in the build. So we'll look at the payoff period of that. What that has told me so far is that recovering as much heat as you can is the most critical thing you can do. So when the hot water comes out of the still, it goes through basically a big fancy hot water cylinder in a coil, heats up all that water, um, and then we've got 450 liters of, of hot water, which will then go into our boiler and provide hot water the, to the distillery. So, so that, I think that's the most critical thing, recover the energy that you can, then use as energy efficient cooling, but use a closed loop. I mean, for our still, we use a lot of water. We're gonna save about 180,000 liters of water a year. Yeah, thank you very much. And when you've got the results of that, I think that would be a very interesting talk for the expo. It's going to be super geeky. It's good. Yeah, people will absolutely love it. I think it's great. Um, uh, good. So uh, I know, I, and I, uh, I mean, with reference to your distilleries, and I, okay, not so much at the moment with this current situation and that, but what approach do you take? What are the environmental considerations? for having your distillery open to the public for visitors and that kind of thing. Is there anything like, because I mean, there's one thing, like there's all the production stuff that we talked a lot about, but that is part of the business as well, is having people coming to see you in, in some cases. No, Russ, I don't know, Russ, are you open? Generally yeah, open? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Currently so, open, every, yeah. so you all are, yeah. Um, so yeah, anyway, that, that was another sort of a slightly different angle, but that, you know, sustainability of having people coming to visit you, are there particular things that you've thought about and stuff like that? I don't quite understand the question, David. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Good start. I think I guess, I, I guess from visitor experiences, you know, the, the the biggest the biggest thing maybe to think about is if it's not heating, it's 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 consumables. Um, tasting cups. Yeah, tasting That's cups, sort of glasses. Straws, yeah. And, and certainly for us, the, um, you know, the whole pandemic, we try to be zero waste. Um, in an ordinary environment, we have um, towels in our, um, you know, toilets that we, we wash, you know, at the end of the day and replace. But, you know, we, we kind of assume that people are, are quite forgiving and they don't mind drying their hands with a towel that as some, a few people have used before on, on the you know, basis that it's better than using a dryer or paper towels, but we can't do that now. So, you know, we're using huge masks, disposable masks, disposable paper towels, um, along with everything else. So from my point of view, th those kind of consumables, ordinarily we use, we use towels um, for people to, um, you know, dry their hands with after they've washed their hands. Um, we use paper straws, um, and I'm a, I, I will die on a hill about straws because I really like straws in my GNT, especially when people put things like pink peppercorns as a garnish. Like, give me a straw because I don't want those <laughs> drinking around a pink peppercorn. Um, I guess tasting cups is, 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 is a big one because I, I don't like the little wax tasting cups. Um, so this is, um, we, I've decided that we will use the little PLA clear tasting cups but we have a hot composter here, um, which composts at 60 degrees and, and compost down that PLA so that it's not, it's not kind of going to be burned, but it's a compromise and, and yeah, but we kind of found a way around mm. it. Okay. Does that make more sense now, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I guess the other, sort of, 
building on that as well is is having people to visit your distillery that's when you really get to convey and and you know tell people about what you do and how you're behaving uh sustainably and what sort of environmental issues you put in place so um as an example where we are we're fortunate to be on a few acres so we, we've planted you know we've got 400 native trees planted here we've got an orchard planted here we've got an apiary with beehives um we've got the the gin refill scheme which people love so yeah, obviously you want people want to you know see the the PLA cups or paper cups and, and recyclable towels, and they want to see you um, using plastic straws. But also you can go a step further that and really sort of sell and promote what and why you you know behave the way you do. Um, and we've found that that really engages people, especially when people get you know come in and see the beehives from the tasting room, that type of thing. It's um, quite immersive, and people love it. Good and uh, Russ. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the tasting cups, I think, is the, the biggest issue for us. You know, we're, we're not in a nice location in terms of, you know, it's, it's an industrial unit. Uh, there's no hiding from that. And, you know, it's rented, so we can't put ponds or uh, any of um, orchards. That'd be nice. So, I mean, at this stage of the journey, because we've only been around 18 months, you know, that's, that's where we are. So you, you've got to work with what you've got. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're... If you're setting out and starting up a distillery and thinking about how to set up a visitor center with that sort of goal in mind, then yeah, go right ahead and follow what these two do. Um, and yeah, focus on that stuff. It makes a big impact, I think, and it's a great way to convey the message uh, about the sustainability of the brand. That's your that's your advert. Um, but yeah, for me, we, we just reduce uh, what we can. So yeah, tasting cups are the, are the big one, really. I would, That's definitely, good... um, I would definitely encourage people to have uh, electric car charging points um, yep. so that, so that yeah, no, you're, you're rewarding those people that choose to visit you in an electric car. That's always, I mean, that was, that's kind of the thing, isn't it? For a lot of uh, locations of distilleries, you kind of have to drive there, right? Not, not all, obviously not, but like a good chunk of distilleries, mm. they're, they're just getting there, there's a thing. So I think that's a that's good um I do that. Um, sorry, Russ, got another gin related question. <laughs> it's okay. I'll, uh, I've got some work to do here. So. <laughs> um, it is what are the key, key green issues to consider around botanical choices and then kind of followed up with about what do you do with waste botanicals after distillation as well. But the main one is what are the green issues to consider around botanical choices? I guess I'll start on this one and, and no doubt we'll follow up. Um, where you're sourcing them from so where they're grown uh, often with things like lemongrass it's going to be coming from thailand or southeast asia you've got juniper a lot of it comes from mainland europe um so yeah where the botanicals originate from in the first place how they're grown whether they're organically grown or whether there's heavy pesticide use and who you source them from so most people won't be going direct to a lemongrass farmer in in thailand they'll be buying from a, a wholesaler so working with reputable wholesalers who are willing to give you information on where things are grown how the crops are grown etc um there's there's lots of easy things you can do yourself and it, it does depend on space i guess as well so um you know we've been growing our lemongrass here you know we've got the honey here we you can look around you as well to to reduce the impact of the botanicals you're using so if you've got um any herb growers nearby and you want to use some fresh basil or locally grown lavender or there's plenty of things once you start looking you'll be able to find within your county on the other side of it when you finish distillation um there's lots of great things you can do to upcycle botanicals so as an example um hot composters which will mentioned earlier you stick your spent juniper and coriander in a composter and it's the most beautiful smelling compost <laughs> that rock stand that you've ever come across um also speak to other businesses. So we work with a, a brilliant bakery called Hacksby Bakehouse down the road from us. Um, we send them the spent botanicals and they can then use that and turn it into glazes and things to use on pastries and cakes and all sorts. So just because you've finished uh, distilling with it, there's still plenty of flavor and things you can do with those botanicals. Um, yeah, just get creative. Yeah, I, I think that it can be really hard. One of the hardest things for a, you know, a new distiller setting out is just to have the time to, to kind of look at your, all your suppliers and kind of assess them and, 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 and do that. I think that the simplest thing to do, which probably has the biggest impact, is to try and use organic botanicals. Now, quite often, or, organic is quite a tricky one, and, it, and it's it's actually not clear cut from a farming point of view that or 
you know, organic is necessarily better. It, it, it's not a, a clear cut, but if you don't have the time to interrogate your suppliers, or if you're using a kind of main supplier to supply all of your botanicals, then it's probably better than, you know, it, looking at all the spec sheets and saying, well, have copper-based sulfur, copper-based um, pesticides been used on any of these? So when we're when we're working with fruit farmers, for example, we 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 choose not to work with any fruit farmers that use copper-based pesticides on their their farms because we view that as a as a red line. But we don't demand everything's organic because that would preclude a lot of great farmers from from working with us. But I think in, in terms of the amount of money in a bottle of gin, the, the botanical bill isn't a huge part. So spending a little bit more on organic botanicals, if you don't have the time to assess your, your, your Thai basil or your, your, um, your you know, the, the purple P1, wherever it's coming from in the world, then, then just going organic is probably the best thing you can do. Um, I mean, we, had a, we had a very specific one, which is, you know, we use oak moss in our, in our gin which is a botanical which is covering the woods around here because it's a botanical which loves a really clean, um, um, you know, ancient forests. And in the autumn, it all just blows into the courtyard and it kind of covers the courtyard. But the, 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 the ecology in this part of the world, the environment doesn't support enough for us to go out and forage that botanical. It would be really, really irresponsible for us to go out clearing the woods of, of oak moss. So where it is picked in, in Bulgaria and the ancient forests, it's actually a little extra income for shepherds who kind of tend their flocks um, and they, they will pick some of the, 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 um, the oak moss from a part of the world where the, the, the forest supports it. So we did that, but then the EU introduced a, um, uh, a oak moss is basically used in perfumery. And there's a, there's, a, there's a compound in oak moss which can give people allergic re reactions, when, not when it's distilled, but when it's applied directly to the skin. So now most of the oak moss is actually prepared and has to go through a chemical process to remove that before it gets into the perfume industry. So that then kind of limits, again, our access to that botanical. So sometimes, sometimes just thinking kind of environmentally is, is one thing, but then, you, you know, the world will throw things up in your way and it can be very, very difficult if you're determined as I am to use a specific botanical for a flavor profile. Mm. I think uh, it's a good point. And I think actually possibly that's one of the biggest green issues or sustain, let's say a sustainable issue um, with botanicals is people foraging and not doing it responsibly. Like there is a real, like it can be dangerous, but it can just be, it just can be very, very irresponsible. It was interesting. You're talking about the organic botanicals with, as I was speaking to, Tommy from Beacon yesterday, and he said one of the problems with with in in their experience with a lot of organic stuff is the inconsistency. So there's some uh, there's these plants, and then it's also I guess when we even like when we're talking about organic, like there's a difference between it like being there's like organic certified, which is a very particular set of rules, and then there's just like just because it's not organic certified doesn't mean that it's got a load of chemicals on it i mean like a lot of the juniper might not be organic certified but then if it's all grown wild it's not necessarily so easy to do that so um i think yeah i, I think that if you're if you're setting out on the distilling journey think like a mature distiller think like a, a, a distiller at scale so don't just accept the botanicals that are coming in and don't do your own flavor assessments of those you've got a you've got a you've got to think that botanicals coming in at different points in the year from from different years yeah. they're going to taste different so, you know, you've got to be in the mindset of, of assessing all these botanicals and, 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 and you know, um, to, to think like a scale distillery. If you're starting out and you're, you, you don't have complete traceability from a bottle of gin back to an individual batch of botanicals that you can trace back to source, then you're starting out in the wrong way. You know, sooner or later, if you want to run a mature distillery, uh, uh, you know, working with some of the biggest buyers, you're going to have to have that traceability. And it's just good practice anyway. So think like that. And then, you know, you won't come into problems later on. Well, that's right. a re really good point, which uh, it, it encompasses not just, you know, where you're sourcing botanicals, but your branding and how you behave and your brand voice and everything. And it was something that we were told very early on is when you're setting up yeah you're not setting up a small distillery you're not deliberately setting up a craft distillery because you will only ever stay that 
and it, it and, and you know like you said it can you can kind of build in bad practice from the beginning so if you're starting a distillery is anyone watching this or anyone else involved in the expo start it as if you're planning for that 10-year plan and you're going to be on the shelves wherever you want to be you're going to be collaborating with who you want to collaborate and go in behaving like that from the beginning and that that, that covers everything that does filter down to branding and sourcing and, and the full kind of Good. Right, we've got a few, few more questions coming in. Nick asks, is anyone using UK made bottles? Hmm, good question. We're we not. Are, we're not. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, oh, no. No. A lot of people are using Allied Glass. You know, they're a really uh, good, reputable supplier and they do um, really well. Um, for us, um, having a bottle moved by sea freight from Calais to the UK is not much different from having it shipped down from Derby by road. So we don't, I'm, I haven't been dogmatic about, um, you know, that having it sent from Europe um, because the, the carbon intensity is in the bottle, but someone else might fight me on that one. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, I've got another question about, uh, so this is something that was mentioned in the pre-record, uh, and it was about um, making flour from spent grain. Um, is this grain dehydrated first and milled, or like what's the process for it? Yeah, so that's a, the, a contact at mine. Um, uh, he runs a brewery called Good Things um, Brewing, and shout out to them because they make um, amazing beers, um, and they have... They, they, they generate all of their electricity on site for all of their brewing processes, which is uh, quite something. Um, so so they, are, they have built a huge dryer to um, basically dry um, the, the spent grain in them, beer mash. Um, and then they have a beautiful old um, German flour mill and then they send send the flour to local bakeries and pizzerias and things. Um, I'm not. I, I can't say too much about it, the specific process, because he has invented this system and and built it. And he's he's an ex engineer, and and the the thought process is very innovative, and it's really quite a remarkable piece of equipment. It's not like hugely energy t intensive, um, and he will be looking to kind of build those and, and supply them to, to breweries as a, as a business, I should think. So um, it, it, it is possible. Great. Thank you. And then the uh, questioner said, thank you very much for the answer. Uh, probably uh, we might, if anyone's got any last questions, because we're nearly out of time, please send them right now. Um, but we do have another one uh, from Lisa and she asked cork stoppers to do or not to do. I guess a little bit more, maybe just about closures in general, perhaps. So we don't use cork stoppers currently. Um, we have experimented in the past and we have come across other products that obviously that use them, but we, there's the dreaded cork taint and the, the cork um, affecting the spirit negatively. And we have had that in products that we have in the distillery here. So we actually currently use a plastic stopper um, and that's down to performance, performance issues for us. Um, it is something you know hands up that is it is a, a piece of plastic within our products which we're not particularly happy about when that is part of being an open distillery is a wearing where there's maybe uh, pitfalls and things you could do better so um we are looking at that for next year to swap out that plastic component for something else um so yeah that's where we stand on it'd be really interesting to hear what the other guys have got to say and whether they're using plastic for the performance or whether they're using cork and if they've had any problems russ yeah, so uh, yeah, we we have a, almost exactly the same ethos as, as Chris. So um, it's plastic, um, and it's on the basis of consistency. Am I happy about it? No, really not very happy about it. Uh, equally, I'm not happy with the glass bottle. So um, you know, both both parts bring issues, and they're both connected. So if there's you know, we're looking at alternatives for that, and that's you know something for the next twelve months for us for sure. Well. So um, cork, a, a natural cork stopper has a negative carbon footprint. And it's, it, it's just something I really like. Um, I, I've put, it, all of these decision um, points are difficult, position, difficult decisions to make as is, you know, we've been talking through. Um, for me, I didn't want to use um, plastic shanks 
um, because I do want to, I, I think using language, um, you've got to be careful. I don't want to use language where um, it is, it, it can mean different things to different people. And I want to be able to say our bottle is, is, is zero plastic. Uh, and, and for a similar related reason, I don't use agglomerated corks um, just because of the, the way they're made. And that leaves me with a natural cork. Um, and I think over the last um, five years, I've had maybe two or three phone calls from customers who have said, should my gin have a color? And I've said, we, you know, we've said, well, ha have you kept, have you had it lying down? And, and in all of those cases, uh, it was stored in a, in a bottle rack or, or lying down in a fridge rack. And it just so happened that that, that cork um, gave a little bit of color taint to the spirit. Now, for me, I, you know, in, I, I, I view that as an acceptable risk. It, it doesn't happen when you keep a bottle stood up and it doesn't happen with all the corks, but it will happen once in a while. Um, and many, many people will view that as um, unacceptable risk. And I totally understand that. And my, 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 my gut tells me to feel the same, but um, I can't do it. So it's I a good question. That risk. It is a good it's, question. It's, it's, there, there's there, a new material is needed. We're the same. We're on the agglomerate, the the sort of combined material where we don't fancy using. Um, so yeah, if anyone out there's got some ideas, that's not. Uh, cool would would you like to see the color taint in one of the returns? Because I've kept one. Yeah, yeah why not? Go for yeah. it. Give me a second. Yeah, um, Russ, whilst we're doing that, there's something that you mentioned, which was like, I'm not very happy about the glass bottle, so I'm looking for an alternative. But but like, what could it be? Like, if you have any idea, sorry, do you have any ideas? No, no, <laughs> like, it's, not, it's not an obvious solution, actually. Um, I mean, aluminium it doesn't work because if you put it in aluminium where you seal aluminium stuff, the, the material you use to seal that dissolves in alcohol that's uh, spirit strength, and it, it's just it's not an obvious solution. Mm. So, this okay, one is clear, okay. and, and this does have a color tape. Yeah. And and that is as bad as I just picked up one of your aged gins, have you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's as bad as I've ever seen it, and 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 I I'm I'm you know I would be happy with that, but I just think for the for the for the very rare occasion when it when it occurs, um, I I, I guess. Uh, it depends maybe on the strength of spirit as well, because if we, we've got sort of new makes at 47 percent up to 63, 64 percent and we have a bottle here at 63 and a half percent and it, it, it's tainted color and, and flavor as well. Um, I haven't looked into it, but I imagine whatever is tainting it is alcohol soluble. So the higher that strength of spirit in that bottle, the, the more flavor it's going to impart. Um, yeah. Mm. Uh, well, what we're talking about is what alternative is there to a glass bottle? And we're a bit stumped. Yeah, um, I, th I think it's I think it's really difficult for a, for a premium product where you you kind of want to see the liquid. Um, you know, I I think if 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 you've got like you know bottles of Johnny Walker that can be put in really cool looking cardboard bottles because it's a pouring spirit, then that's that's great. Um, but for a, a, a spirit at the moment in at the moment, I think I just go back to like, we, we've got to be a competitive premium product first and a sustainable business alongside that. Um, and if, if, you know, let's just be pragmatic that when the consumer is scanning 300 different bottles of gin on a shelf, um, you have to appeal. Um, and, if, and if someone is looking for a gift and they want a nice heavyweight glass bottle with all the trimmings, then um, you, you, you know you've got to you've got to be in that market. So I think it just comes down to minimizing the impact, making the decisions with the eyes wide open, choosing your suppliers, you know, using recycled glass. I, I, I did actually have a conversation with with the guys at Allied Glass because um, that you know between colored glass runs and and clear glass runs. Um, there's several thousand bottles worth of glass, which is wasted because it still contains the dye. 
you know, you don't remove all the glass from the furnace and, and you base all the glass moves through the furnace. You put clear glass in, but you've got to wait for that color tape to go out. So a producer who is willing to accept um, different shades of color in their bottle would be able to say straight away, we've got a great environmental advantage because we're using glass, which would have otherwise been wasted. Except it probably causes problems when you want to recycle that glass um, <laughs> in that it can't go into one. <laughs> It'll all end up in a brown yeah. glass beer bottle. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, this, is a, this is a silly side note, but like, is there still like separated glass recycling? Because like all the recycling stuff around me, it's all mixed. It's not, you don't separate the green and the white. No, it's, it's all just, in fact, the one that's near me, you can just open the lid and pour the bag in. I mean, <laughs> but um, it, is, it, is it just me or is it where you are? And it's a funny question. Is it still separated glass? So, yeah, I would say it is. It should be separated and should be um, put into different streams. And I think if it does go into a mixed thing, that causes a lot of problems and means you can't turn it back into fresh uh, bottles and yeah. actually it ends up in a one-way street which is literally in the road so ah. that that glass will end up in the road and that is recycled but it's terminal so it's the yeah, yeah. That, that's a great point russ often when we talk about recycling we, we often think well it's going to end up in the same form as which we Not bought true. it in but that's very rarely the case you know it's gonna it's going to end up in um home insulation or it's going to end up in, you know, yeah, road road additives or bulking agents or all sorts of things. And, um, you know, they are once it's been recycled, doesn't mean it can be recovered and recycled again. It often means it's going to be used one more time and then lost. So mm. it's, it's that's recycled. exactly what pushes the CO two emissions up for a glass bottle. Right? Yeah. It is infinitely recyclable if it's recovered properly, recycled yeah. properly, because you can just turn it into more glass. But mm. because of those things. Yeah, the, it, it, yeah. It, I mean, it's, 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 it's for the for the consumer. Um, I think one of the most interesting things about this has been the, you know, the, the ceramic bottles and and you know, a consumer will reach for a ceramic bottle, without even thinking that they're buying something which is incredibly energy intensive and single use. It's non recyclable, um, and I would really I would really like to see those um, those those brands that are using ceramic bottles to maybe use the ceramic bottles for their direct to retail business. And then for their for their pub bar distributor wholesale business, have a glass bottle which is sprayed white, which is the same shape, same look and feel that can then be recycled. Hmm. Or ship it in the ten litre thing like you do. <laughs> uh, and I think well, as we're just finishing up now, um, but it it really, I mean, we talked a lot about bottles, and, it, and it's such an important thing. And I guess like one of the things that at least seems to do have something to do with it is. I know what you do, Chris, which is the refill scheme. I mean, that doesn't completely solve this issue about bottles or not bottles, but at least, you know, that's one less bottle than it's, yeah. the, you know, Absolutely. Than it, you've taken one out of the, out of the loop. So that's something. So, uh, yeah. And that's, that's growing for us. So we just got our, our figures from our first 12 months of doing it to the last 12 months and it's grown 35% in the number refilling. And oh, again, honest. talking about transparency, it's still only 1% of all our bottles. But it's a, it's a growing uh, growing percentage, and it's a start to start. We've got plans to roll that out further. So, yeah, can make it can make a big difference. And I've just had a comment from um, Nolan from who's from Allied Glass. He's been watching, uh, <laughs> and he says um, all that glass is recycled back into the system. So there we go. Well, thank you everybody for watching, um, and thank you for all the questions. Thank you so much to the panel again for giving us so much of their their time, um, and we'll sure. Uh, we're um, we're going to do this again next year because it's so important. It's only going to get more important. So hopefully we'll see you again. All the best. Thanks, David. Thanks, Cheers. guys. Thank you. Bye. Cheers, guys. Cheers.